just to do ministry. Um, so uh, I have the under understanding he's uh, going to be student counselor. Um, very important job. All right, I think that's it for today's announcements. Let's go into the Word of God. And we are reading from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. We have finished the first part of Romans. Uh, but before we go into the book of Romans next Sunday, we're starting Romans series 2 uh, from chapter 9. We want to pause and see the big picture of where we're going as a church. Uh, what it means to be strong in the gospel together. And the theme verse, in fact, for this year is this very verse we're going to read so let's read what uh, God's word says about being strong in the gospel. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. In fact, if you're here, can we all read it together? It's on the screen or your Bible. Um, we could all read it, God's word together. Let's read it. Go. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses Entrust to faithful men who will also be able to teach others also. Amen. Sorry, I messed up a little bit. Uh, this is the word of God. Um, I want to start with this observation. When a loved one passes away, usually, before they do, they leave their last will and testament. It is uh, not a goodbye, but it is a way of saying their last words, important words that they want to leave behind for their family members. Uh, sometimes it entails legal processes, uh, like who is going to this property to go to as a, as the result of this person's death, and sometimes a lawyer comes and actually makes an official document of will and testament to settle all the property issues. If somebody that you love in your family, your mom or dad or your you know, family member dies before they die and they say something to you with their dying breath, we would tend to value that, right? For the rest of our lives. And my grandpa passed away like 20 years ago. But I still remember his wishes for me. He wished that uh, his first grandson, which is me, wanted, uh, should be a doctor, a medical doctor. But it was a dilemma for me because I could not bear to see blood. <laughs> you know, I get a small color. I, can't, I have to close my eyes. I can't, oh, wife, can you take care of me? So I'm scared of blood. Uh, I think there's a phobia, phobia name attached to fear of blood. Uh, and so I wanted to, you know, follow what my grandpa said at, because it's his last word for me, but I couldn't. But uh, God provided a way out. He made me into a spiritual doctor. <laughs> so I pray for uh, others and I share the word of God in hopes that it will cure them of their sins and grow them in their spiritual walk with God. And it is my belief that grandpa who is in heaven looks down upon me and is proud of me, I hope. Because I've turned out to be a doctor, a spiritual doctor that does God's work and heals not just not the body, not the body, but the spirit by God's grace. You know, I believe it's like that with our Lord Jesus. If Jesus said something on this earth before he went back to heaven, wouldn't we value it, right? Wouldn't we value the words of Jesus when he said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations and teach them all that I've taught you. Behold, I'll be with you to the ends of the earth. Will we not really value that? What Jesus was saying in a nutshell is saying he wanted us, you and I, to be a disciple and to make disciples. Disciple is the key word today. Wouldn't we value that? But I find it ironic that we, hesitant, we are hesitant to be labeled as disciples or followers of Jesus Christ. Oh, okay, I'm a Christian, you know, I go to church, I'm, you know, a part of a church, member, I'm a member of a part of church, I'm a Christian, that's okay, I don't mind being called a Christian, 
but to call me a disciple is like too much for me, and I kind of want to back off from there. There is that culture within Christendom, within the Christian culture, to refrain from that word disciple, refrain from that that concept of following Jesus. Sunday is okay, coming to church, doing a little bit of service, and taking Bible study is okay, but I wouldn't call, consider myself a you know, super Christian disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. But if, in fact, to be a disciple and to make disciple was the last wish of our Lord Jesus Christ, although he didn't die, right? He's gone back to heaven. If that was his last will, how ironic it is that we don't want to be that. We want to be something else, something more comfortable. So I want to raise this question. Why be a disciple of Jesus Christ? We're not playing games, right, as we come to church or we, we follow God. We're very serious about what it means to be a Christian. And we want to understand, why do I need to be a disciple? What, is, what should be the motivation for me to follow what Jesus said before he left this earth. We look at Paul's letter, and Paul is, you know, decades after Jesus, right? And what Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20 about go make disciples, Paul, he explains that in more detail for us, what Jesus meant, what it means in real life. In, uh, in, in other words, to have a vision, to see to visualize what Jesus meant. And so we read a letter that Paul sent to his disciple, Timothy, during the last days of his life. Paul's last days, life, uh, time of his last life, his life. Last days of his life. And that is the book of 2 Timothy. I want you to look with me in verse 1, how Paul addresses Timothy. Verse 1, it says, you then my child. Let's stop right there. Paul is calling Timothy his child. You know, Paul was not married, right? So he doesn't, he shouldn't have children. <laughs> he doesn't. But he's calling Timothy his child. So understand Paul and Timothy relationship. We've got to look at the book of Acts a little bit. Remember when Paul, he was sent out by the church of Antioch. Uh, he, uh, he was he was, uh, you know, passionate about the gospel. So he went on a missionary trip. He went on an evangelism trip to the central part of modern-day Turkey. He visited all these cities. One of the cities he visited was Lystra, Lystra, L-Y-S-T-R-A, Lystra. And he shared the gospel there. He preached the gospel. Not many believed, but there were a few who believed. And among those were two women. One was... Uh, um, <laughs> Lydia, uh, I'm sorry, not Lydia. One was Royce, uh, Lois, and one was Eunice. And Lois, uh, uh, Lois and Eunice were family related. Lois was the mother, and Eunice was the daughter. And so they became believers, and Paul went back to his church, home church. After some years, he wanted to revisit the churches that he had planted, he had uh, witnessed to. And so, you know, he was so glad to be back in Lystra and see how the Christians were growing. He was so happy to see these two sisters that had received the Lord, Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. But Paul was introduced to another young man at that time at his, on his second journey in, in Turkey, in Lystra. And this young man was none other than Timothy. Timothy happened to be the son of Eunice, and so he was the grandson of Lois, right? So this was a spiritual family, and he probably heard the gospel through his mom and grandmother. And when Paul saw Timothy, young Timothy, he was excited. His heart was beating, and he fell in love with this man, this young man. He wanted to make him a disciple of Jesus Christ. He wanted to invest in him because we can imagine Timothy was like a half-breed. He wasn't a full-fledged Jew. His dad, his mom was a Jew, but his dad was a Greek. So he would have been considered an outsider, you know. He would have been by himself a lot, we're guessing. And Paul saw, saw a great interest in this man, this young man, this pure man of God. And so he suggested, proposed to Timothy, come with me. 
like Jesus told, told, uh, called Peter out, come with me, you know, I'll make you fishers of men. Maybe with that kind of heart, Paul reached out his, his hand to Timothy and said, come with me, let's do God's work together. And so Timothy accompanied Paul into this, this missionary journey. So you can imagine after many, many years, Paul is still calling Timothy, my beloved son, my son in the Lord. Now from here, we understand that Paul wanted to remind Timothy of what his true Christian focus should be. I want to give you the background that Paul was in prison in Rome. In fact, he was facing his last days. He would be beheaded by Nero, the emperor. His days were numbered. He knew this. And at his last, on his last days, he wanted to write a personal letter to his son, spiritual son, Timothy, like a last will and testament. I want you to remember just this. This is the most important thing. I want you to grasp and remember and never lose sight of, never lose focus. And this is what he said in verse 1. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Paul is saying, be strong in the grace that Jesus has given you. What is grace? Grace is just another literal term for gift, present. Remember the gift that Jesus has given you and me? And be strong in the gift. Enjoy that gift. What is the gift? The gift is, was the gospel, right? Jesus Christ, whenever Jesus Christ is associated in the New Testament, it's, it talks about the gospel. And so Paul is saying, no matter how busy you are, no matter where life takes you, what turn uh, life forces you to turn, always for, do not forget to not be strong in the grace, in the, the gospel uh, that Jesus Christ has given you. We can even say, be strong in the love. We can call gospel of love, right? We be strong in the love that Jesus has given you. Paul wanted to remind Timothy of what his motivation should be to live as a follower of Jesus Christ. To be strong in the love. And so we could phrase it this way. Why did Timothy have to be a disciple of Jesus? It was because he and Paul owed a debt of love to Jesus. We can rephrase it like that. They owed a love debt to Jesus. And so this should be the reason why they should be a follower of Jesus Christ. It's like fuel for them to, for Paul and Timothy to continue to live as a follower of Jesus Christ. They need the fuel of Jesus' love. Not a one-time love, you know, long time ago, I confess my love to Jesus, come into my heart, be my Lord and Savior. Not just an acceptance prayer to God, to Jesus, but every day renewing that fuel, so to speak, that love relationship with Jesus. Be strong in that. Have your tank filled to the full. Only then can you and I can live uh, Jesus-following life. Just like our cars run on gas, and Joseph runs on coffee in the morning. Disciple of Jesus runs on the love of Jesus. Why was it important that Timothy remember this fact at this time in his life? Because it has been a while since uh, Timothy decided to follow Jesus. Our love grows cold. Our love gets warm. It was hot but the temperature drops. That is just natural, our our weak, uh, sinful behavior. You know, some of you might know the name of Bobby Jones. He was a famous golfer uh, uh, back in the 1920s and 30s. And uh, he was famous because he, oh, we have a picture of him, Pastor. Uh, He was famous because he did the Grand Slam. He won the Grand Slam in two not 2000, 1930. Uh, And uh, if you know what the Grand Slam is, you know that it's like he won every major tournament that year in golf. Well, it was a pretty big big name. Uh, And he pioneered many areas in this world of golf. Do we have the picture? 
we do actually. Right? Um, can somebody help Pastor David? Anyway, uh, Bobby Jones. Bobby Jones was uh, famous, and that year when he won the Grand Slam, he was suggested by a, a professional golfer and saying, Mr. Jones, you should convert to professional. You're in the amateur field, but you should go professional, pro. When are you going to do that? And uh, Bobby Jones said this. He answered by saying that, I am an amateur. And the word amateur is a French word which means love, to love something, amour, you know, amateur. And what he was saying was, I want to stay amateur. I want to stay loving golf, not a professional golfer. I want to be an amateur golfer who loves, who lo does it because they love it. So he was saying, I don't, well, I don't uh, play for the title. I don't play for the fame and money. I play because I purely love the sport, and he wants to be an amateur golfer. In fact, he was a lawyer, and he stayed amateur for the rest of his life. Paul wanted Timothy to not lose sight of this fact, to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus means that our love needs to stay amateur. Don't aspire to be a professional preacher, a professional Christian who comes to church habitually as a ritual. I've been Christian, you know, you might say I've been Christian for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. So this is my way of life. This is a culture. I am Christian by birth. Paul is saying, don't go that route. For those who call themselves Christian, they need to be strong in this love, renewed every day with the relationship with Jesus Christ. Not as a professional Christian, but as an amateur follower of Jesus Christ who loves to follow Jesus. In fact, Paul describes for us this love that he had for Christ and how he pursued Jesus out of this love in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. And I'll read for you. It says, For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, Therefore, all have died, and he died for all, that those who might live no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Again, for the love of Christ controls us, compels us. See, Paul went to first, second, third missionary journeys, and he went through shipwrecks, he went through uh, stoning, persecution, he was he, uh, beaten, 39 lashes. Uh, he was ridiculed. He was punished, put in the dungeon many times. And he says, the reason I've been able to uh, persevere that was because the love of Christ just pursues me. It, it, uh, it grabs a hold of me and controls me. Paul was refreshed in his love every day, seems like, with Christ. How Jesus forgave his sin his past, present, and future sins, how Jesus gave him the hope of resurrection. This life is not the end. This flesh is deteriorating, but the spirit is alive, and he will spend eternity with God. And he was just infatuated with that love, that hope that he had found in Jesus Christ. And so he confesses, for the love of Christ controls us. Brothers and sisters, our first attitude as Christians should be that that we are not professional Christians. We don't act, do the part of a Christian because you're born into a culture like that. You're living that culture. But let us stay amateur as a, as a person who is always fresh in the love of Jesus. Let's remember that we owe a depth of love to Jesus Christ. And that was the one thing that Paul wanted Timothy to remember. As Timothy was pastoring in Ephesus. He was a professional preacher, a pastor. Don't you forget, my son, you need to be strong in the grace, in the love that is found in Jesus Christ, his cross and resurrection. That's why Paul was able to finish his race and he's encouraging his disciple, his son, Timothy, to do the same. Do you have a Paul? I believe we all do right? You're all here because there was a Paul in your life. Paul who had encouraged, who had 
interest in you, who prayed for you, and who invited you to come to church, who invited you to a Bible study, who invited you to that revival service, who invited you to that Christian club. There was a Paul in your life. You would never have been here as a Christian were it not for them, who thought you were important to God, who shared the gospel with you, who showed you the Bible, who helped you understand what it meant. I, I had a friend, I had a person like that. My dad was my Paul. Not only that, I able to, was I able to hear the gospel and receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior in high school through my dad's preaching. That was not the end. That was actually the start. Uh, I uh, went to college and came back for the summer break. Like a lot of our singles, our young adults, were probably in the summer, right? You stay here, but summer you go back, break, go back. And Well, I went back to home. I went back home for a break, and uh, my dad suggested that we have this one-on-one -on -one time. Uh, I want to remind you, my, my dad is a professor in seminary, and he wanted to teach me some of the things that he was teaching his students. And he's taught me how to read the Bible, how to do quiet time for the first time. He taught me how to share God's word, especially gospel with somebody else. So he folded this paper, trifold, and drew the bridge illustration for me and had me memorize all the verses attached to that story of the gospel, the cross of resurrection, and gave me some stories I could tell along the way to, to make this alive pop up. I remember going back to school and sharing that with people. It became a part of me, a tool that I used. And uh, I could see that my dad invested, my, my Paul invested in my life. And I am who I am because of his love for me. Paul is saying that we need to be fresh in this love that God has for us, Jesus has for us. How can we stay the love alive? Remember that, and remember that we are in debt to the love of Jesus. We need to put a log in the, in the fire that we have for Jesus. Of course, you and I, we are weak we are made of flesh. So our love grows cold. Your love is not the same as the first day you believed in Jesus Christ with all your heart, right? My heart is different. You know, we get colder and, and warmer and colder. But a way to remind ourselves is to put a love, log a relationship with Jesus every day. We need to remind ourselves every day of the love. As we put one, as we, as we sing to the Lord, how we love him. We're putting a log on our fire to rekindle the love. As we respond to Jesus as, after we read the word and maybe write a prayer of love and thanks, it's like you writing a thank you card for your significant person in your life. And you're putting this log of love on the fire to rekindle the love. As we worship him every day, our goal is to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And only then, only when we're motivated by this amazing love of Jesus, can we live a life of a disciple as Jesus had wished us to live. Let us remind, remind ourselves every day that we are indebted to the love of Jesus Christ. Paul goes a little bit further. Why do we need to be disciples of Jesus Christ? The second reason is this, that we are not only indebted to Jesus' love, we owe a debt to a disciple of Jesus. Can we say this together? We owe a debt to a disciple of Jesus. We owe a debt to a disciple of Jesus. And Paul is reminding Timothy of the debt that he owes to Paul. Verse 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Timothy, you have heard from me. What is this? What is the object of uh, what, what uh, they've heard? Paul, Timothy has heard, has heard. It is the gospel, isn't it? It is the, the cross and the resurrection, the love story of Jesus, and it was transferred to Timothy. You've heard this. You've learned this from me and from many witnesses. Yes, there were many people, but I selected you, and you are the one who heard it firsthand from me. And it goes on. He says, because of this, I expect you to multiply other witnesses. What you heard in front of the witnesses, entrust to faithful men. So first, 
Paul is expecting Timothy to share this word with faithful men, and then these faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And don't stop there. Don't stop with the faithful men. Go further with other people who will also uh, learn this important fact and be disciples of Jesus Christ. You know, I want to uh, draw a picture on this um, just to make it more visible. You probably understood what, I, what the word said here, but I want you to kind of grasp it. And uh, after Pastor Saul did it last time, I thought it was a good idea. Do you see my screen? Does it work? Oh, yeah, okay. High tech, right? <laughs> um, so this is Jesus, you know, he, so to speak, shared the gospel with Paul. Let me draw Paul. Um, you know, typically, Paul is depicted as a bald guy, you know, and he's a, my stick man here. But uh, because he's an older gentleman, I'm going to draw beard. Perfect Paul, if you know. And this Paul shared the love of Christ with Timothy. He's a younger guy, um, so he has hair here. Right? Oh, yeah, I forgot to uh, draw here. So Paul is saying, I have received the love of Christ, the, the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And he says, you've heard it too from me. And then... What is Paul's expectation and what is Paul's interpretation of what Jesus expects for us? He says, share it. Share this love, uh, the same love with um, faithful men and women. And then these faithful men will share with other men as so when Jesus was thinking about discipleship, uh, he was not just thinking about here, but he was thinking about here, making disciples and having them also make other disciples. So up to here is disciple, making a disciple. Paul, Timothy is making a disciple here, and then here is Disciples making more disciples. Multiplying discipleship is the vision that Jesus Christ